Welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian Church. This is the Hurricane Ida version of our worship. We're recording here on Saturday afternoon in order that we can get everybody home to be preparing. And I know that as you're at home, um, obviously we all have uh, some anxiety and we're praying that God would be merciful to our city and our state and our people. I'm so grateful to the crew that has come down here uh, to film uh, this version of our service so that we can be connected over the internet and hope that your power stays on long enough to for sure to be able to see this worship service and participate in it. Back in the spring, I did a visioning sermon where I called us to be a community that is resistant, resilient, and renovative. Last week when we had our state treat on critical theory, we talked about being resistant to worldviews alien to the gospel. Hardly could we realize how resilient we would need to be. What a week it's been. A funeral of someone who died from COVID, tragedy and humiliation in Afghanistan, and then all of a sudden, a category four hurricane bearing down on our city and our state. We need worship, and I'm so glad that you're watching uh, wherever you are, and I hope that you will feel connected to this body of Christ as we proclaim his resurrection and his truth. I just also want to let you know, uh, following the storm, uh, if you need assistance, if you've been trapped somewhere, if you've got considerable damage, uh, you can check your emails. We've put Whitney Alexander's cell phone is there. Uh, of course, you can look all of that up on the directory or try to contact the church. We will be organizing teams as soon as it's safe uh, to help our folks dig out. Again, if you want to be part of a team, also let Whitney know we're going to need a lot of people to help us clean up from this. So for now, uh, dear ones, take comfort in the wonder and the joy that our God is sovereign and he calls us into his presence. Listen to Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the sea and its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at the sea's swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, that holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her, and that right early. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. God utters his voice, the earth melts. But the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Be still and know that he is God. He will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's worship the Lord now as we participate through song. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his success and journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore Till moon shall wax and wane no more To him shall endless prayer be made And endless praises crown his head his name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice to our King be highest praise rising through eternal days just and faithful song and 
and infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name to our king be highest praise rising through eternal days just and faithful he will reign jesus shall reign let every creature rise and bring blessing and honor to our king Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud Amen. To our King be highest praise, rising through eternal days, just and faithful. Rising through eternal days, just and faithful, he will reign. Jesus shall reign. Would you pray with me, dear church? Everlasting one, king of the ages, author of life architect of time, all glory, honor, praise, and thanksgiving be yours. And you have created all things from the greatest to the least, and this alone is reason enough for us to heap praises onto your name. Such power, such sovereignty. And the knowledge then that you also see time in its entirety from its beginning to its glorious end, why this is also a reason for us to stand in awe and then to hear that you intend to restore what you have made, and that you will lift us out of the stream of time to be with you in eternity. How could we not bow the knee and worship you even today? Through Christ we, we do pray. Amen. Hear these words from John's revelation from the fifth chapter. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Do you feel 
though the world is broken, we do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory, is he worthy of this? He is. And does the Father truly love us? He does. And does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? Oh, He does. And does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. He that refreshing to sing and to worship and pray about the Lord's future. It's the question of the future that we're taking up. This series was planned months ago and how could we have known that the question of what about the future would be before us after such a difficult and auspicious week uh, where an unknown future presses in us, on us so uh, heavily. But alas, that is what's before us, and we're going to take an interesting angle on it, I think, to take a look at an early story from the life of the church, a story about the time when Peter and John were on their way to the temple, shortly after the Holy Spirit had formed the church and filled them, and they saw a lame beggar, a usual character who stood outside, who lay outside the temple gates begging for gifts, but instead of giving him money, 
that gave him the healing in Jesus' name that caused him to go walking and leaping and praising God. That created a sensation. People wanted to know what had happened and why. And so Peter's impromptu message, extraordinary in its brevity and its power, explained what God was up to in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And remarkably, this has a lot to say about what we can expect in the future. Well, before I read it, let's ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. We thank you, blessed Holy Spirit, that you worked in the lives of Peter and John to heal a lame beggar and to remind us that that was but a foretaste of all you are planning to do in the future. We ask for those times of refreshing, that hope of the return of the Messiah to set all things right. Would you speak to us now, even as we are anxious about the hours to come, about what you have promised to do through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So everyone ran together. They wanted to know what was going on, and this is what Peter said. He addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though our own power or piety have made this man walk? It was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, who glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had denied, we had determined to release him. But you, you denied the holy and righteous one. You asked for the murderer Barabbas to be granted to you. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Now his name, the name of Jesus, by faith in his name has made this man strong, this man whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for the restoring of all things, as God promised by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but what has been revealed belongs to us and to our children forever, that when we may keep all the words of this law. Well, for the last month, we've been identifying the deep questions of the human heart. These are questions that we simply cannot answer inside ourselves. The answers to these questions, because the questions are so profound, have to come from outside of us, and not just outside our personal bodies, but outside of humanity in general. They have to come from beyond. Now, as Christians, we know and celebrate a God who speaks to us from beyond in words we can understand. He speaks directly to us. We know that the answer to all of life's unanswerables is in Jesus himself. But let this, lest this sound trite to you, let's just remember that the answers to these most difficult questions are not merely Jesus as a formula, a transaction for how can you can get a ticket to heaven. They're not even Jesus as an ethic for how to live a good and right life. They're not found even in Jesus as a model for a fine spirituality, a way of practice that will help you experience the God within. It's something much more profound than that. It's the Jesus known to us in episodes. It is the actual events of Jesus' life among us which bring to us the answers for the questions that we cannot answer on our own for the knowledge that we crave. So I'd like to just run through this a bit to go back through some of the questions that we've been asking over the last five weeks 
and then see how an episode in Jesus' life has provided for us the answer which alone satisfies. So remember in the first week, we talked about the question of loneliness. Am I alone, stuck in myself, or can I somehow be companioned? And the answer was the event of Jesus coming to us in the flesh, his incarnation. God answered our profound existential loneliness by taking up our flesh and blood, by brothering us, by being our companion. Well, the next week we asked the question, what about guilt? How do I get rid of this sticky feeling of having done wrong, of being inadequate? We noted that we can't work it off. We can't blame it on someone else enough to get rid of it. We need an actual answering of the wrongs we have done. And that occurred in the episode of Jesus' life that was his crucifixion, his atoning death by which our sins were truly paid for, so the burden of them leaves us and becomes his. Well, in the third week, we asked the question about death. What comes after life? Is there anything more, and is the more something good or worthy? And the answer to that question most profoundly is in the episode known as Jesus' Resurrection. The third day, he rose again from the dead and declared, because I live, you also will live. Well, last week, we asked the question about purpose. How do I know what I'm meant for? What am I supposed to be doing in the world? And the answer was the mission that Jesus gave to his apostles and through them to us, to love the least of these as if we were loving Christ to take the good news of the events of his life to the ends of the earth. The purpose of our lives is to participate in the mission that Jesus enacted of loving his Father and loving those God put before him. And so this week, as we take up the question of the future, what's going to happen in the future, we'll discover that the answer is in the episode of Jesus' life that is yet to come, his return his second coming to set all things right. Isn't that glorious to think how God answers our deepest questions and needs by acting in the world in Jesus? Everything that he did and said is so significant to us. But the great mystery is that we get to be joined, spiritually, mystically joined to the events of his life so that everything that they meant becomes true and operative in us. When we place our faith in Jesus, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, his life becomes our life. His death atones for our sins. His resurrection gives us eternal life. His mission fills us with purpose. And his promised return will help us answer the question, what about the future? It's a really pertinent question this week, isn't it? As we're all mourning and reeling and wondering about the tragedy in Afghanistan, as we wonder when the fires in the West will ever go out, as we grieve over yet another earthquake in Haiti, as we watch the Delta variant sweep through and begin to even take members of our own church, and as a hurricane is hammering down upon us any moment now, what's going to happen in the future? Is everything going to be all right? Are we going to get out of this alive? What will happen? Is the future bright or is it dark? Now, there are a lot of people with a lot of answers to this that are tending to turn towards the negative, getting a bit cynical, wondering if we should have any faith in all in a good God and his promised future. I'd like to read you some quotes about such times. See if you relate to any of these. A generation is weary, broken, burnt out, rootless, and without hope. Dismay is a mainstream concern. The prospect of imminent crisis, a new dark age, is a habitual way of looking at the world. There is fear that civilization is under threat, decline and collapse, sickness and death, infect nearly every cultural endeavor, intellectual, artistic, literary, scientific, philosophical, and religious. 
the notion of humanity's spiritual and moral progress lies in the dustbin of history. A profound sense of spiritual crisis is the hallmark of the decade. There's an erosion of what might be called civilizational confidence. In other words, widespread disillusionment with the West and its supposed cultural achievements. We will not be able to find our way anymore. Do these statements of where we are and what the future holds sound to you like things written in the 2020s? How about the 1920s? Isn't that amazing? We often think of that decade as the roaring 20s when people were sneaking into speakeasies and having a great time dancing in flapper dresses and living it up before the Great Depression, which they didn't know was coming. But actually, it's not so. Historian Joseph LeConte has detailed the cynicism and the disillusionment and the dismay that people in the 1920s in America and in Europe had about the future. You see, earlier in the century, there'd been a myth of human progress that swept everywhere. We believed that science and technology and enlightenment were going to transform the world, that Western civilization would bring a golden age around the globe. The Great War of 1914 to 1918 shattered that illusion. The horrors of advanced technology inflicted upon human beings in flesh and blood. As power met power, the carnage was so terrific that all optimism for the future was shattered. Following the Great War, right on its heels was the Spanish flu epidemic. Tens of millions died around the world. It became clear we were not entering a golden age. Science could not save us from every disease. Human beings were not getting better. Optimism was in the dustbin. Writers took a cynical turn. The idea that God is on our side, that his special people were on their way to a heaven on earth, turned out to just not be true. We're in such a season again, mourning what has been lost, mourning the chaos and the inability, it seems, that we have to solve the massive problems facing us. Many would agree that the future seems bleak. We can't quite get over the fact that it's so hard to be a Christian and maintain optimism. But the wonderful thing about LeConte's book is that he notes that amidst the cynicism of so many writers in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, there were two men whose Christian optimism shone through a detailed understanding of destruction and death and the conflict between good and evil, but ended up still affirming the possibilities of life and the future. They were my heroes. Both C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien fought in the First World War. Lewis was wounded by shrapnel and had to be evacuated. Tolkien, too, who fought the Somme, had to be taken out because of trench fever that nearly took his life. When the war was over, these scholars returned to an Oxford and an England that was full of cynicism and disillusionment. Their fellow professors were all writing profoundly negative things. But from the pen, first of Tolkien and then of Lewis, came stories of heroes whose characters were flawed, who frequently made mistakes, who walked right up to seeming defeat, stark realism of battles and betrayals. But in the end, in Middle Earth and in Narnia, something would happen beyond hope, what Tolkien called the sudden joyous turn. Grace would intervene. And out of darkness, light would shine. Out of certain defeat, hope would come. Amidst so many who were losing hope, there were Christian writers with optimism, not necessarily about the near-term future that all would be cozy and comfortable, but optimism for the final victory of God, for His reestablishment of His kingdom on earth, for the remaking of everything. Is that a hope we can share? 
the hope in the return of Jesus to set all things right? Well, I could take you to some apocalyptic literature, some wild stories, try to make predictions that you and I know don't come true. Scripture doesn't read that way. But instead, I want to take you back to this little tiny story of Peter and John on their way to pray in the temple in the earliest days of the church, walking by all the usual suspects, seeing a man who parked himself by the temple gate, trying to get coins from people going to the temple to pray. Only they stopped and they noticed him. He begged all the more. No one ever looked at him. They took him for granted. But silver and gold have I none, said Peter. You remember the song from childhood, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And remember the song? And he went walking and leaping and praising God. It created a sensation. And people wanted to know, how did this happen? They were looking in awe at Peter. Is it possible that this was a God on earth? Was he a healer? Peter tossed off this impromptu message extraordinary in its power. He let him know, no men of Israel, look, I didn't do this. It's the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the one who healed this man. But it was exactly through the servant that he sent. His son Jesus, you remember him? A few weeks ago, you were the ones who called for him to be crucified. You watched him before Pilate who wanted to release him and the whole crowd shouted, crucify. By the way, you killed the author of life. That's some way to start a message, don't you think? Not really the best way to win friends and influence people. Hi, so glad you're interested. By the way, you killed the author of life. But he went on. A little bit of assurance. Look, I know you didn't know what you were doing. You thought you were just getting rid of a public nuisance. You thought it's what your leaders wanted you to do. But remember your scriptures. All through our Hebrew scriptures, God said his Christ, the Savior, would have to suffer first before glory. That was Jesus. He had to suffer and die for our sins. You thought you were getting rid of him. His father had other plans. You acted in ignorance. You didn't realize you were actually part of a greater plan. God knows he's patient with you, but look, you still have to be responsible for what you did. You still rejected him. So now's the time. Now's the time to realize the bigger picture. God had a plan from the past pushing all the way towards the future. The healing of this man is a sign of what God's going to do everywhere to make the lame walk and the blind see and the sinful be forgiven and the broken world be set right. But you got to turn. Instead of putting Jesus away, you got to look to him again. You got to rise up and cry out to God. You need to repent, which literally means to change your mind. And you're going to get some great things if you do. Your sins will be blotted out. And God's going to send you times of refreshing because he'll put his own presence inside your life by his Holy Spirit. Your tired, weary, broken, cynical souls will be refreshed by his presence. And you'll join us in waiting in the greatest of all hopes that God's going to send his Christ again. And when he does, he's going to restore all things to how they were meant to be. You put Jesus to death, but in a sudden, joyous turn, beyond hope, God raised him from the dead. Look up to that. Jesus is in heaven, and he's coming again. You want to be on the right side of that return. It's a pretty good off-the-cuff story, don't you think? There they were, words of life, words to make people crazy. What do you mean I killed the author of life? What do you mean you, God wants to bless me by turning me from my wickedness? How dare you speak that way to me? You know, within days, Peter and John were arrested, but they didn't back down. They told the religious leaders, 
There is no one given under heaven and earth by whom we must be saved but Jesus. So they threw him in jail. You see, no early Christian in all of our history ever thought that near term was going to be a life of comfort and coziness. Christian realism got it from the beginning that we're in a conflict. There's a conflict in every human heart between good and evil, between God and self, between the light and the dark. And there's a conflict in the world between God's purposes and the evil one's purposes. This conflict will rage all the way until Christ returns. And if we conduct ourselves on the mission of bringing the light and the love of the gospel, we will endure conflict. In a world where natural laws give the world a realism that makes hurricanes come and accidents occur, God didn't make a safe world, a Disney world. He made a real world where actions have real consequences. The first Christians knew this. It's not going to be easy. But they did not lose their optimism in the ultimate future. They didn't become cynics. They were buoyant, joyous, successful in the face of opposition and suffering because they knew the long-term game. The God who had raised Jesus in a sudden joyous turn was going to, in a sudden beautiful turn, return again to set all things right. But you know, they also knew that in coming to us in Jesus Christ, in answering our most profound questions of loneliness, of guilt, of death, of purpose, through the face of Jesus Christ shining in the world, God raised the stakes for anyone who ever heard that story. Because now we know God is this way, the way he is in Jesus, and no other way. It's the best possible news. Who is God? What is he like? How does he feel about us? He feels like loving you enough to become one of you, to suffer for you, to live for you. But that means, if you want that, you can't manufacture your own gods. It means you can't cling to your own idols. It means you can't invent the way you want the world to be. He calls you to consecrate yourself, to turn from your wickedness. I have to swallow a lot of pride to realize that turning from wickedness is a continual task for me. Turning from self is a moment-by-moment -moment commitment to agree with God about what's going on inside my heart that I don't always successfully win the conflict with evil and self and sin. What I need is refreshing. I need the power of the episodes of the life of Jesus to work in me. Such repentance, such change is actually the secret to the times of refreshing in the present moment. Because grounded in what God has done in Jesus in the past, we learn to trust that the God who raised Jesus is the same God who will return to set all things right. And when I believe the bookends of that story, I am refreshed, breathing fresh air in the midst of the noxious fumes of a broken and rebellious world. I wish I could give you comfort about the near-term future I can't tell you it's going to be easy. Oh, there will be glimpses of God's glory along the way. He will provide refreshment enough to get us through day by day as we rely on him. He'll send us surprising acts of love from other people. He'll send us fellowship with other believers. He'll give us the hope of worship and of his word. Oh, he will refresh us and sustain us. But it'll be hard. There'll be conflict, there'll be evil, there'll be accident, there'll be hurricanes. Christians understand the realism of life in this broken world. The question becomes in the present moment, will I cry out to him in faith, turning from repenting, whom I desire to be at the center, to be safe, comfortable, full of idolatry, will I turn from that and cry out for the time of refreshment that only he can give me? Well, I realize that the answer to the future is not found in manufacturing enough security, having the right investments, having the impenetrable house in any storm, or having everybody do what I want them to do. The only security in the future 
is to be connected to the Christ who is going to return, to be on His side when He sets all things right. The time for that trust, the time for that refreshment is now. And every moment is now. Fair forward, beloved flock. We got a lot to go through. But the God who holds the future in His hands will sustain us. He will sustain you and send you just what you need. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you. You are the answer to life's deepest mysteries and profoundly the one who has secured the future of the redemption and restoration of the world. Give us grace as we go through the trial of this storm to cling to you in faith, to cry out to you and know you to be sufficient. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well. sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more, praise the Lord, praise close with a benediction, I want to invite you to join your hearts with me wherever you are in prayer. Uh, allow yourself to uh, express agreement in your soul with, uh, with, with the words that are prayed. If you're able and would like to get on your knees and beseech God's mercies now with us wherever we are all over this city and state and world, uh, feel free to do that as well. Uh, but take a moment. I, I beseech your concentration uh, wherever you are that, that this might be truly prayers to God for His mercies and grace. Oh God, our Father, we are in harm's way. 
How often we have prayed for others in difficult straits around our state, around the world, around our nation. But now, Lord, we are in the center of the bullseye, and we are crying out to you for mercy. We are already grieving the loss of so much beauty, of so many structured things, of dwellings and homes, of streets that occur through such storms. We are anxious and we are worried and we are sorry and we are anticipating the work of the mess and the rescue. But in all of it, we ask for your mercy. Would you prevent loss of life? Would you prevent tragedies? Would you stretch forth your hand and save us? Hear us as we ask for that. Father, we ask particularly this week for our frontline healthcare workers as if COVID were not enough. Now there will be injuries and accidents to deal with. There's so little room in our hospitals. Lord, would you be at work? Give energy and skill when there is only exhaustion. Make room where there is no room. Find blood supplies when they are needed. Lord, be with the first responders with the ambulances, with the police, with the power workers. Father, restrain the hand of evil that would take advantage of others suffering or opportunities when others are not looking to do horrible things. Restrain evil in our midst, we pray. Lord, be with all those who will be outside, who will be working and serving. We pray, Lord, that you would enable our church to be a beacon of light and hope to serve and to care for others. Father, we continue to pray for those who are ill, remembering especially Calvin Schoonemaker in the hospital, for all those who have had surgeries or procedures in the last week, for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, remembering David Williams, Nell Patrick, Jackie Carnes, Jared Williams, and Jack Anderson, who've all recently lost loved ones. Praying, O oh Lord, for the situation in Afghanistan, remembering our service men and women, especially those in our, of our own who are Marines, grieving the loss of their brothers this week. You would comfort them, give them focus and imagination and strength. Be with all those who feel lonely and isolated and frightened in the storm. Move someone to reach out to them and care for them. Father, we are in your hands. There is no place to go but to you, and we trust that you will give us grace to help in time of need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thanks again to Chris Phillips, to Jay High, to Lauren Honey, to Blaine Wilkins, to Dexter McLean, and to anybody else who might be in here that I haven't seen uh, for putting on this service today. Please stay home and stay safe, and know that wherever you are, this benediction is for you because it comes from the mouth of the Lord himself. The Lord I am bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up a shining countenance upon you and give you his peace now, this week, in the storm and always. Let those who belong to Christ, who found refreshing in him, trusting in his return, reply, blessed be the Lord I am, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace, dear ones. Amen.